Good morning. Welcome into our morning worship. We're delighted to greet you all. We're very pleased to have the Salvation Brass with us to lead us in our worship for today. We had a good concert last evening and we invite you to come along again this afternoon at 4 o'clock. We'll be listening again to the Salvation Brass. And Major Minday is here to lead us in our worship and we welcome each and every one of our visitors. Peggy Keats and family have given the flowers for today. These are in memory of John. <coughs> we have activities here in the coming week and if you're able to join, we invite you to do so. On Tuesday, there's a Cameo Club meeting which starts at 9.15. The young people meet with parent and toddlers group. It's 9.30 Wednesday morning. And then Thursday <coughs> Wednesday evening is the Ladies Fellowship this week. That's at 7.30. A Bible fellowship on Thursday, 10.30. That's followed by a luncheon club, and then the over 60s friendship club, 1.45. Our core magazine is available. It's in the foyer on the table. If you'd like to have one, would you please make one as you leave our meeting this morning? We welcome our major to lead us in our meetings. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a bit of a hazard, isn't it, this one? But, um, it's good. It's great to be here. Uh, and it's great to be able to share worship together. This is the most important part. This is a focal point of, for every Christian, I believe, is focusing on the cross of Christ and worshiping him together. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to have a responsive reading at the very start of this service together. So if you'd like to stand, please. <laughs> And read will come up there. I'm going to read the words in white. If you would please read the words in yellow. God of all glory, today we celebrate who you are. We celebrate your great love seen in your Son, Jesus Christ. We celebrate your great activity in our lives, seen through the work of your Holy Spirit. We celebrate our unity in one body. You are the God of the old and the new, the God of the past and the present. You are the God of the future, which is to come, and we again declare our faith in Jesus Christ, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, bless our worship this day. And now may we echo God's laughter. And rejoice to God. May we join in God's painting. May we join in God's Son and in creation. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, Welcome to worship. I'm really pleased you're here today. <laughs> Once a vicar, and it was winter in Scotland, and he looked out into his garden, which was totally enclosed on all sides. You couldn't get into the garden or out of it. And it had been snowing in the night, and there was a great dog in the garden. And he said, How on earth has a great dog got in the garden? And his wife said, That's not a great dog, that's our dog. <laughs> they always thought their dog was white until they saw it against the purity of the snow. We serve a God. Pure, pure as one. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, we see these before us. <laughs>
Let's just uh, stand in a moment of peace after singing a wonderful song, a song for some of you, you may not sing that often, written over 200 years ago, that song, one of the oldest songs we, from words we have, um, but so applicable for what we bring. And bringing us all together, uh, a church is one, a church in the community, uh, a church in the army, a church in God's world. And so as we as a group from all over the country gather here this morning with you, we know that we're celebrating God's love. So shall we just pray and just close, pause for a second just to get our breath and just to clear our minds so that we can enjoy worship this morning. great to be able to join you this morning in celebration of uh, your love, your love that we, you, you allow us to bring to the world. We're a group of Christians here in Ipswich, uh, joining with our friends around the country this morning <coughs> celebrating. The, mass, the message of the band here is always to bring enjoyment, to bring fun in our worship, but also to bring the message that you want us to deliver. That's our aim, that's our goal, and to uh, Together also, we obviously think this morning we've uh, sent that message to our friends at Woodbridge. A small group from the band has gone to Woodbridge this morning and we pray that uh, they allow them to share with this love that you, uh, you want us to have. It's great to see a hall full of people. It's great to see a hall full uh, made up of all generations. That's what uh, we want to see in the army and uh, I'm thankful for that and I'm sure you are as well here at Ipswich. As we now enjoy the message that Richard will bring us and we pray for Kat as she brings the uh, young person's message as well. Um, that's always fun and we'll enjoy that I'm sure. And um, Pray for everybody here, I'm sure there's uh, thoughts in everybody's minds. Uh, it's been a busy week no doubt for a lot of people but uh, today's your day and we now want to enjoy that um, throughout the rest of today and this afternoon's festival as well. Um, <coughs> pray for the, the world there's an awful lot going on in the world at the moment, uh, good and bad. Sadly, the bad tends to get the news, but uh, we obviously thought last night of Haiti, and we must do that again today. Uh, countries of that type are always affected worse, it seems. Um, we have to be thankful for what we have, and realise uh, what others don't have. And I'm sure in the coming days there'll be uh, requests for aid and assistance, and I'm sure the army will be at the forefront, and. Um, with other charity groups and we pray for anybody that gets sent and to assist and we pray for the work that will be done. We pray for other obviously political reasons and efforts in the world that are going on uh, normally through conflict. Um, conflicts have always happened, they've happened since your day but we must uh, accept that uh, these things are not good but we must uh, accept that they happen but we pray for those that uh, look after the world uh, and run the world, if you can say it that way, and just pray that they bring sensible and peaceful outcomes. Now as we join with Richard for the rest of the morning, I pray that your name is well received. Amen. Amen. And uh, yeah, absolutely right, it's great to see a congregation of all ages and all generations, and we were really blessed by the scene of the young people last night. And uh, they're going to come and sing now all for thee. Perhaps you'd like to give them some encouragement. <laughs>
Hey, what's your random fact? Well, you can all see how athletic I am. <laughs> so, I played in the 1987 Cup Final. Wow, overwhelming truth. <laughs> well, partly. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be in the Royal Marines band when I played there. But I'm a Coventry supporter and country run that way. So. <laughs> One more. So, random facts, please. <laughs> You already know what you ready? <laughs> um, I have had dinner with a princess. I have had dinner with a princess. <laughs> An actual real life princess. A Disney princess? Someone dressed up as a Disney princess. So, based on just that one random fact, no background, does Seb look like a truth telling kind of fella? Or a little bit of a liar? Who thinks he's telling the truth? Oh wow! <laughs> Impressive! And who thinks he's telling a lie? Oh, I kind of want to go with you, Bob. The answer is true. <laughs> I had dinner in uh, the country Jordan with the Princess of Jordan. Uh, we had seven courses. I can't tell you what they all were. Um, <laughs> but um, that was an amazing trip once in a lifetime type job. And I've had dinner with a princess. Okay. So it's going to stay there because it's going to help us in a second and in the next song. But there are so many situations, it's so easy sometimes to get up caught and not tell the truth. But there's no reason to. Just be true to yourself, be true to who you are, and the world quite simply is a much better place for having truth in it. And my set's going to give us a hand with the song. Thank you. Okay, friends, it's time to sing. Now, as you can probably hear, I'm feeling a little unwell, so could I have some young people, or young at heart people, to help me join in singing? We're going to sing together as a congregation the way it's going to be. Do you know that song? Yes. Cool. So you know the actions. Okay. We'll start walking this way, so if everybody could stand up. Band, are you ready? <laughs> okay. Could I have any young people to the front? Yes, yes, this is come. This is open invitation. Open invitation. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so we're going to walk this way. Band, are you ready? One, two, a one, two, three.
Happy anniversary, Steve. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks to the singing company for singing so beautifully, all for the. Thanks to Kat, thanks to Seth, thanks for all this great, uh, great celebration song. And in the same spirit of celebration, but now we're pleased to receive your tonight. <laughs>
thank you very much indeed for that message to us this morning. Thank you. I'm just going to read a few verses of scripture before Salvation Brass brings us a piece of music called uh, This I Know. And then I'll be uh, teaching uh, about this passage of scripture. I'm going to talk to you this morning about a man called Micaiah. Not Micah, but Micaiah, a very different prophet. It's a fascinating story. There's some elements of humour, there's a little bit of sarcasm in this, uh, but there's an awful lot that it tells us about the importance of facing the truth in our lives. It's, it's a tremendous story. I love it. It's little known. It's not, it's not, um, it's not one that you've, you've probably heard much before, unless you preached on it last week and didn't tell me, um, which is fine. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to read the, first, read the first five verses of 1 Kings chapter 22. Uh, and these first five verses will kind of set the scene for where we go with this. So, 1 Kings 22, 1 to 5. This is what it says. For three years there was no war between Aaron and Israel. But in the third year, Jehoshaphat, <coughs> king of Judah, went down to see the king of Israel. The king of Israel had said to his officials, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead belongs to us, and yet we are doing nothing to retake it from the king of Aram? So he asked Jehoshaphat, Will you go with me to fight against Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat replied to the king of Israel, I am as you are, my people as your people. My horses as your horses. But Jehoshaphat also said to the king of Israel, First, seek the counsel of the Lord. I'll come back and explain that in a few moments. Thank you very much. Decide.
Lord, sometimes music is a sermon in itself. And I want to thank you for the sermon that we've just heard. For the response of our friend. That's your grace for his life. And his hands. But we pray that for ourselves as well. May your grace be with us as we further wait upon you. For your word to speak in our hearts. In Jesus' name. upon a time there were two kings. There was Jehoshaphat, who was a good king. Really? <laughs> Quite impressed, Bill. He was better than we didn't practice, but we should have practiced, shouldn't we? Once upon a time there were two kings. Jehoshaphat, who was a good king, hey! and Ahab, who was a bad king. Right. It's holy. We've got that. We've got that clear. Jehoshaphat was all right. Ahab was not all right. Ahab was a bit of a war one. Yeah, okay. What if Ahab was a bit of a war one? Just because we've done the kids' story. Ahab was a bit of a war one. A warmonger. Mm. And Jehoshaphat was a man who sought the counsel of the Lord. So Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, there is some territory up in the northeast of the country that we need to attack together. Because Jehoshaphat is in the north, Ahab is the king of Israel. Jehoshaphat is the north, the king of Judah, Ahab is in the south, the king of Israel. Ramoth Gilead, the town that is under contention, is over there by the king of Aram. So Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, we need to go and win back Ramoth Gilead. So Jehoshaphat says, well that's okay. My people are as your people. My horses are as your horses. I agree with you. We will do that. But first, let's seek the counsel of the Lord. So Ahab goes to his group of prophets. Now, it was common for kings in those days to have a group of prophets to whom they could go for counsel and advice. Now, when I say prophets, I don't just mean one, two, or three, or four prophets. This guy had 400 prophets. 400 prophets to whom he could inquire. And he went to these 400 prophets and he said, shall we go into battle? You've got it up there, thank you. Shall I go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? And all these prophets said, go, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. Every single one, 400 of them said, go. Why is that? Because they are 400 yes men. They valued being close to the king. It was, a, it was something of kudos if you were close to the king in any way. So they said, go for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. They didn't want to say anything else. They didn't want to sort of uh, make him mad by saying, oh, I'm dodging, dodging, dodging. So let's have the next slide if we could, please, now. Uh, Jehoshaphat asked, but is there no longer a prophet of the Lord here we can inquire of? Before we go and fight, Let's find somebody who can tell us what the Lord thinks. And so the next slide, we've got this. The king of Israel, this is Ahab, bad king, answered Jehoshaphat, good king, there is still one prophet through whom we can inquire of the Lord, but I hate him because he never prophesies anything good about me. Only bad. He is Micaiah, son of Imla. And Jehoshaphat says, ooh, the king shouldn't really say anything quite right. So the next slide tells us, the king of Israel, this is Ahab, called one of his officials and said, bring Micaiah, son of Imlar, at once. Dressed in their royal robes, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, 
were sitting on their throes of the threshing floor by the entrance of the gates of Samaria, with all those 400 prophesying <coughs> prophets before them, saying, yes, go. Now these 400 prophets, they were a bit like, they weren't your Ezekiels, they weren't your Isaiahs and your Jeremiahs, who were your premiership league prophets. These were your Vanarama Northern. Vanarama Northern League. I always love it every Saturday when I say, let's go and see the home league match. I always think that's quite funny. Anyway, that's another thing. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, Zedekiah, son of Kenan, had made iron horns and he declared, this is what the Lord says, with these you will gore the Arameans and they will be destroyed. Let's keep going on that one. Thank you. All the other prophets will say the same thing. Attack Ramoth Gilead, be victorious, for the Lord will give it into the king's hand. Next slide. The messenger who had gone to summon Micaiah said to him, look, the other prophets, without exception, predicting success for the king. Let your word agree with theirs and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, as surely as the Lord lives, I can tell him only what the Lord tells me. Here's the man starting to tell <coughs> When he arrived, the king asked him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or not? And Micaiah is sarcastic. Attack and be victorious. For the Lord will give it into the king's hand. And Ahab guesses that he's being sarcastic. So he says, how many times must I make you swear to tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So the next line, Micaiah answered this. I saw all Israel scattered on the hills like sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord said, these people have no master. Let each one go home in peace. King of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you that he never prophesied anything good about them, but only bad? It's a great story. It's a great story. Micaiah tells it as it is, and not how he thinks the king wants to hear it. Micaiah tells it as it is. We have in the world today people who put themselves down as miracle workers and faith healers, who ask for donations along TV programs in return for a sachet of soil or a bottle of oil that will heal them. These people are no better than your Vanaram prophets are. They know better than that. What they're doing is saying what the people want to hear without actually telling the truth. And there are enough of them, particularly over the pond in America. True Christianity lives in the real world. It's not to do with fantasy. It's not to do with fortune telling. It's not to do with being a yes man or a yes woman. It is to do with the truth of Christ that sets us free. <coughs> True Christianity deals in fact. True Christianity, where the kingdom is growing, faces the truth of its community head on. It looks at its community and says, actually, as a Christian church, let's face the truth about this community. Let's face the truth about ourselves and see how much we are doing that is relating to the community. So you could have two pieces of flip chart here. And on one, one you could write, it's which community. And everything that you know and understand about your own community on that flip chart. On the other one, you write, it's which call. And you write everything that you do. And then you see how much of that is actually relating to the community. How much? Let's face the truth about this. And then let's take it to the cross of Christ, which talks about uh, transformation, which talks about hope, which talks about engagement and connectedness. We face the facts about our community head on, right where that community is. <coughs> Jesus did that. This story shows that. And let's have a look more at what this says to us today. <coughs> Eugene Peterson in the message calls those Vanarama prophets, I call them Vanarama prophets, he calls them puppet prophets. They're just puppets of the king. Just yes men. Yes Ahab, you will be triumphant and glorious at the 400 fence sitters. You will win the victory, no problem. And they got a little bit of money for this populist prophecy. But the true prophets and people of God say, this is how things are. Micaiah says, this is how things are. If you attack, you're going to lose. And this is Micaiah proclaiming the word of the Lord for that time. He saw how things were. Back in 2001, 2002, there was a, there was a football match that took place 
between Australia and the Samoan Islands. It was some big uh, football competition sort of down under. It was a, it was a really big match. Um, and the Samoan team decided that they weren't going to train. They, they comprised 11 fundamental Christians. I said, we're not going to train, we don't need to train, because we've got God on our side. We're going to attack them, we're going to be victorious. So they prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. They didn't train, they prayed. They were in the dressing room for an hour before the match. They got their kit on, they got on their knees and they prayed, Lord, give us the victory. We're going to attack the victory. But they didn't train. But they prayed. But they didn't train. They prayed. But they didn't train. And they went out and they lost 32 0. <coughs> True story. They lost 32 0. What they needed was a Micaiah to go in there and say, hang on, you're not facing the facts here. Yes, you can, you can pray all you like. We can pray all we like, but if we're not putting in the one, you know, we can, we can practice our instruments all we like. If we're spending more time practicing our instruments than we are actually getting into a deeper relationship with God through our prayers and through our Bible reading, then it's difficult. There has to be a balance. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings balance. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who guides us into all truth. So they prayed, but they didn't train. They didn't do the hard legwork, if you like. You haven't prepared as you should. Attack and you'll lose is the message they should have heard. But if you face the truth, if you put the effort in, it might be a different story. There might still have lots, they probably would have done it, but maybe not 32 in heaven. God has to reveal the truth because it's something that's beyond us, because God is truth itself. By the truth and the power of the Holy Spirit, God's risen Son has set us free and desires to break through in a new way. And that is the word that he gives to the Pharisees. Jesus gives to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the disciples in that meeting in John chapter 8 when he says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Concentrate on the truth and the truth will set you free. And that asks for personal heart searching. It does ask for serious prayer, but it asks also for a deep action of compassion, of social justice, of understanding, of actually being Jesus over the garden fence, at the checkout, in the school, in the college, at the place of work. That's where the hard work is done. Facing the truth can be hard and painful, but at the same time can be deeply liberating. And sometimes in family situations, it's not easy to face the truth. Where is the truth in that tough relationship? We can't shirk our responsibility by simply saying everything is great when underneath we know it's not quite so great. It happens to us all and can especially happen in our close relationships. Truth will empower you. A guy called Dr. John Schmidt has come up with a dialogue that families can use when finding it hard to find the true words in a difficult time, in a difficult relationship. Perhaps you'd like to look at this. He suggests that one say to the other, you are worthy, you have value, you are the person, you are the people that God sovereignly placed in my life. You may have failed me, hurt me, disappointed me at times, but I am taking off my judicial robe and releasing you from the courtroom of my mind. I choose to look at you with compassion, as a person with needs, concerns and scars of your own. Everything I have and am is yours. I give you my heart, I give you my mind, and I give you my story because you also are an individual person created by God to live in his kingdom story. In this, we give equally. The truth is tough, the truth hurts, but lies are worse. It's a God thing. Truth can never be ignored. It takes guts to face the truth and to name it. The Salvation Army has to face the truth about its decline, about its current state. Your core has to face whatever truth it has to face. We all have to face truths within us, honestly, as it is, as it is. About our own mission, our own ministry, our own prayer life, our own effectiveness for the gospel and the kingdom, our own love for one another, our own love for the unbeliever, for our neighbours, for our friends, and yes, 
for those closest to us. So if you're asking this morning, how is my heart today? Maybe God wants to reveal something a bit more. Maybe there's bits in you where Jehoshaphat might have said, yeah, you should be, you should be saying that kind of thing. Just face the truth, as hard as an uncomfortable thing as it may be. And you will find that great liberation. The truth shall set you free. The liberation which we can find only now in the light of the resurrection. We find that, that our liberation in the empty cross of Christ. Because the cross of Christ speaks of pain and agony and hurt. It speaks of tears. It speaks of conflict. But doesn't it also speak of hope? Doesn't it also speak of resurrection? Doesn't it also speak of a deep direction for our lives? And I pray that this morning we may have a deeper understanding of what the cross means for us. And the truth that it is telling to us by the resurrection of Christ, the truth that he is telling to us about how and where we can grow and develop and mature and witness and be Christ's just for many Amen. Amen. So what happened? Did Ahab go to fight? And if he did, what happened? See you at four o'clock tonight. I'll tell you. Would you like to stand and we go to sing there as a review? Jesus Christ. If you want to come to this place of truth and pray, do it.
Thank <laughs> you.